Welcome to Coffee Break with JFK, the podcast that keeps on giving. Tonight's sponsor is Hawthorne Tile. <laughs> Hawthorne Tile, buy all your tile stuff from Hawthorne Tile. Yes, actually, guess who we have here? Not only the CEO, president, director, and VIP, super important person of Hawthorne Tile, but also the guitar player, songwriter of the band, Love on Ice. Dirk Sullivan. Dirk, buddy. Hi, Joel. Thanks for having me, buddy. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah. You're officially the third person I've interviewed. So you're probably getting pretty good at it, huh? I, I hope so. I hope it, I can pull this off. I think you can. Oh, there goes Bubba. <laughs> With a cone. Every time. Bubba, lay down. Oh, there goes. That was a music stand. <laughs> Bubba, lay down. Go lay down. We actually do have a bull in a china shop here. It's unbelievable. <laughs> no. Well, the thing is, lay down. The thing is, it, it's been a constant, it's been a consistent thread mm -hmm. through all of the podcasts is having Bubba just plow through, you know, everything. So, all right. So Dirk, man, come down from Portland. So how, how's it going? You've got, you've got some new music coming out. I do. Well, <clears throat> eventually I've been doing a lot of writing. Sorry. <clears throat> Um, chicken tikka masala. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I've been doing a lot of writing the past. Uh, well, I mean, I've always written and I've never really stopped writing. Uh, this is what I do when I pick up the guitar. I don't sit and play songs. I usually treat it like a sketch pad and I'm always searching for something. And if I find something interesting, I'll work on it long enough to where I can play it. I'll record either a video or a little note to myself, put it on my phone and where it stays forever and never sees a lot of day. And so I've been collecting these ideas for quite some time. And over the past, like, three months especially, I just hit on some material that deserves to, to come out. And so it kind of prompted me and especially got the encouragement of a couple friends that, you know, dude, it's time, go make a record. So um, I booked a bunch of studio time and I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, man, that's exciting. Well, I mean, it's no secret. I'm a huge fan of your playing. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen you with, you know, with your other band recently and, uh, when you guys played, played the, uh, Rose festival. Yeah. 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 Old mill. Yep. Great, great band. Um, yep. and, and you guys out there slinging it. Yep. And I've gotten to play a bunch in, um, with Andrew Paul Woodworth, who I think the world of, and, um, have a, a absolute ton of fun playing with. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been able to stay busy. <clears throat> which is great and yeah, it's, and, it's fulfilling and, and feel free to name drop as much as possible because and i don't mean that in a in a sarcastic way i mean i i i think it's important that people know like our community and the people we're playing with sure and, you know um <clears throat> it's it's kind of it's a it's a small but pretty expanded community of musicians that we have in the northwest that <clears throat> extends down to la and oh, yeah. seattle and all that yep. and you know a lot you know a lot of dudes from back in the love on ice days so let me let me preface this really quickly for our listeners. Um, so Love on Ice, um, great record. You guys got your big break with the uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure soundtrack, Yeah, right? the Bogus Journey soundtrack. Yeah. yeah the second album, uh, second record, a yeah. movie, whatever the fuck. Showdown. <clears throat> yeah. I'll, I'll never forget the first, the, I remember the first time I heard this, um, Brian McGroovy, Brian, Brian McGrew, great guitar player from Portland. He... Um, he was in the band at the time, my band, and he had he worked for a Sony uh, distributor, and he brought he brought the Bill and Ted's Adventure cassette, uh, bo bogus journey. Yep. Yeah. He brought the cassette, and we listened to it on the way out to rehearsal because we practiced way out in the sticks. So we had like you know thirty minute, thirty five minute drive, and uh, you know I had the Richie Cotton tune on it, Kiss, mm -hmm. you know God made rock and roll, right? And Primus, and then here it comes do do da do 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 da. Do, do. And I'm like, what, what's, what's, oh, we were so excited about it because it had Junior's Gone Wild by King's X on it, which yep. King's X are collectively our favorite band at the time. But when I heard those drums, the stands, and I'm like, well, this is cool. And then the guitar comes in, buddy, you had us, man. And then I, Todd, our bass player was like, oh, I, I know those guys. He, Cause John Hughes was the original, his a guy he uh, hung yeah, out yeah, with. Yeah. John Hughes is the original singer, right? Well, he was, we were called the rain. We, we all, the whole band, everybody in the band, we all met when we were at Mount Hood Community College and we, uh, we were studying music and we, we basically knew we were going to start a band. We, we decided let's, let's go. Uh, and Stan's dad owned a grass seed company Yo, in, Albany in, guy. In, Cor in Corvallis. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had this opportunity to go down to Corvallis, uh, write tunes, kind of 
get our chops together and play frat parties and, and play some of the pubs down in Corvallis for a year. That was our goal. We'll go down and play Corvallis for a year, which we did. We're, and, and I worked for Stan's dad at the time. And, wait, 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 real quickly, to add to this, where did Mark Weber fit into any of that okay, equation? M- Mark... Because uh, you guys were all Albany guys. Yeah, all Albany guys. Mark and Stan were really great friends all through high school, and they, and they played in a band together in high school. And then they... Um, and then Stan was already, Stan has, went to Mount Hood Community College to study music. Um, I didn't come up there. I went to Lynn Benton my first year, and then I went up to, uh, up to Mount Hood my second year of college, and that's where I actually really officially met Stan and Mark. They were, room, they oh, were roommates. You didn't know you didn't know him in Albany? <clears throat> no, I met Stan a couple times, but just didn't know him well, but uh, but uh, knew he was somebody I should know. And, and Tony Villanueva, who was my friend who also went to high school with those guys, he and I were playing music together. And um, we knew we were going to go get Stan and start a band. That's pretty much what our goal was. So we were going there. You guys had a mission. Yeah, yeah. Well, we figured we figured we'd pull something together, and 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 we did. We hit it off really well. And then Dan Kruger, the singer of Love on Ice, he we met Dan there immediately, almost. And he's from Bend, and he was there uh, studying music, but he was a, a violinist and played guitar. Um, and, and so. Dan and I hit it off immediately, and and he basically started crashing at our house all the time, and we um, um, would play guitar up to late. We smoked tons of pot and, and, <laughs> and played and, and played guitar late into the night. Made funny little uh, cassette tapes, and um, and just goofed off. But we knew we wanted to start a band. And funny at the time, Dan just was going to be a guitar player. Wow. Yeah, he had no what because he, he's he didn't, a great singer. He didn't, he didn't aspire to sing, and so and then once we got to Corvallis, but he he sang. He, could, he just wasn't. He didn't fancy himself as a singer. He didn't fancy himself as a singer. Exactly. No. Nope. Uh, but he he was very musical. Dan's probably one of the most musical humans I'd ever known. He'd walk up to the, a piano and play, and and he could play anything. He's really good. Uh, as well, just a great musician. So he uh, anyway. So we. Uh, decided we're going to move down to uh, Corvallis, and we spent a year uh, playing uh, down at Corvallis, and that's where we met John Hughes. We put an ad out that we were looking for a singer, and John was still in high school at the time. He was, just, I think, he was just starting his senior year, right? And then he came and auditioned for us, and it was like, oh, no problem, perfect. Yeah. And so, great singer, and he had a PA. Uh, he had everything. He had, it was just great. It was like it couldn't have been a better <clears throat> situation. I mean, it wasn't like he had a great voice, but he didn't have any gear. He, he had everything. Right. And so it was, it was, that was really a, a great situation. And so, um, so we did that for a while and I'm not sure at what point we transitioned from him to a guy named John Sherwood, um, who was also somebody who went to Mount Hood, a uh, super funny dude. And he became our singer for a bit. And well, who was playing bass at the time? Tony Villanueva. Oh, okay. Tony. Okay. And the interesting story is, that he he ended up leaving the band. Um, he wanted to do something completely different. He moved to Austin and started the band The Derailers, and he they became huge and wow. made tons of records. And then Tony ended up um, even with a songwriting. He was he worked for Sony Music as a songwriter. That's crazy. <clears throat> yeah, and so, but that's um, I'll leave the rest of it for when you interview Tony. Um, <laughs> but so at that point we were we were looking for bass players, and we went through a number of bass players, and and um, the guy that we ended up with was a guy named Bryce Hyder once we moved back to Portland and started playing clubs and Bryce was another guy from Bend and uh, super super nice guy super good you know um, and he's the one that played on all of our demo first demos and we decided that we needed something a little different in as far as a bass player goes I'm not exactly sure why and how I, I didn't necessarily feel it but the other guys kind of wanted to move on and so we let him go and we auditioned a shit ton of bass players and then ended up with Brent, our friend Brent Williams who also had gone to Mount Hood with us and um, why, why wasn't Brent the first choice do you know he he wasn't in our immediate circle he, oh, he, was, I somebody, see. he was somebody we knew and we knew quite well right. but he wasn't like you know, he didn't make the trek with us down to Corvallis, and when we came back to Portland, he was doing something else. Music. I just didn't, just didn't. It wasn't something that's, that we'd even thought of. And it wasn't until we we, were, we started auditioning that Brent came in, and, and um, we ended up playing with him. I was like, wow, this is this would be stupid to go anywhere else. And so um, that's how that whole thing kind of came about. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah, that that's really exciting, man. I love you know you know me. I'm a history guy. I love how that all kind of comes together. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, okay. So, 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 what was? Did Stan ever know that you were that you were 
that you were stalking him and you were trying to oh, prove him? I think that he, he, he was on board. I, I don't think he knew that we were stalking him as much as, as he knew he wanted to do something. He and Mark have been playing music together uh, quite a bit, and um, and I'm not sure I'm not sure if what their goal if there were goals or what was going on with that with, with within that. But um, we definitely knew that we we wanted to do something um, with Stan. We didn't know exactly what it was going to be at first. It's funny, Dan. We Dan came in and he was like playing violin with us, and we we tracked a song with Tony singing it at the Mount Hood Community College. Um, studio, um, uh, Eric Johnson, Eric Savage Johnson's one that actually recorded it. And, uh, it was a song called dreams and duties. And it, it was like kind of a Kansas type of thing. Dan was playing violin. Wow. On it. it was a kind of a cool tune. Does that but, exist anymore? God, somebody has got to have a copy of it. Yeah. I, I haven't, I don't, I'm terrible with that. Was shit. Stan I, was Stan good about keeping that stuff. Would Stan have it? He might, he might. But you know who knows? Yeah, you know, Stan has boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff. He just handed me all these old Love on Ice posters, and wow. he had all the original T-shirts. And, and Stan has it's amazing. How okay, we, we got to talk about one of those yeah. at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rock the hell out of a Love on Ice T-shirt at some point. Yeah, um, yeah, they exist. So okay, so obviously, to back to our listeners here. Um, aside from the well you guys do that you do the ep and then one of the songs gets uh gets uh put on the uh bill and ted soundtrack and then yeah let me take a step back really quick yeah yeah, yeah, when yeah we dan like i said dan hadn't really talked about singing didn't really thought it never came up that dan would be a singer in our band it just didn't didn't seem like it just didn't seem like what we were looking we just didn't think about it and it wasn't until which is crazy because he's such an integral part it's yeah it wasn't until it wasn't until Vill- oh, it wasn't until villain the wave left that we just kept on writing songs and i remember at one point dan just started singing and it was like well fuck there you go and when we did covers dan used to be always the one that would do you know i think i'm trying the, to remember what covers dan would sing the when rush we, stuff no he didn't do that but i think that he he always like sang the acdc songs All or right. he sang like uh you know the you know and we always knew Dan could sing. Yeah, what were what were what were some of the covers of, or at least the bands that you were covering it, for the for the frat parties? It sounds just like a fucking JFK set. <laughs> Van Halen, Cheap Trick, yeah, ACDC, it, exactly what it Aero was. Smith. I mean, you you have you're playing our set list. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Okay, so okay, um, just really quickly. So you guys end up doing you and Love on Ice ends up releasing an album nude on Interscope Records. Interscope. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But we're going to, we'll get in all of that. But I just want to say that is the record that like really came out of that whole EP and the soundtrack. And so, and that was, we'll get into the production of that, who did it, who did what, but I really do want to continue to just unpack how it, how it continued to go. Right. So yeah. you so Dan sings these songs and yep. you're like, Holy crap. Well, there it is. Yeah. It wasn't until we moved to Portland and uh, we were all renting, we we're all living in this house, uh, 911 Southeast uh, 15th, you know, two houses off Belmont. And we, you know, we we're practicing in the basement and, you know, Tony Bales, Dan starts singing and we don't really lose a beat. And it's pretty much like, holy shit. And we write a bunch of songs and pretty soon we're playing Monday nights at Satyricon. And it happened very, very, very fast. We That's wrote, crazy. We wrote a lot of material. It's about 89, right? Yeah. That is about right. Yep. And so I remember. I remember like, uh, God, I'm trying to remember so many, we had so many cool songs, but then we wrote Foot in the Grave. We came up with Foot in the Grave really fast, that song. I know you know that tune. Yeah. And, um, and so then it was like, oh my God, we got to make, we got we to gotta do some recording. We got to figure out how to record this. We got on a bill at Satyricon, our first real gig other than Monday night. So I think we played like three or four Monday night. Um, and uh, I don't remember, George, who was owner of Satyricon, called us. And said we, they need an opener for a Wednesday night show, and it was Mother Love Bone and Allison Chains on the bill. Oh my god! And so we, I remember going there and and how many tunes did you guys have at that point that were your own? Everything we we had, oh. we'd stopped doing covers completely. We were doing just uh, how much of the first record was on was did you guys have at that point? Probably probably half of it, and and all the sun, all the EP stuff. Yeah, Sunshine yeah. Girl. Yeah. Yeah, stuff that a bunch of stuff that didn't make the record, okay. but we wrote a bunch of stuff really quick, and and it was just I mean it was super fun time, super massively creative. Wow. Um, I mean it was like it it was really fun and easy. Stan would come up with the drum beat, he'd just start playing something, and we'd make song out of it. And by the time we were done with rehearsal, Dan would just have to write lyrics. Yeah, let me and let me let me jump on that real quickly. Yeah. We've talked about this when we uh 
we, we when we were hanging out in Portland for that Rose Festival thing, and Stan was hanging out, we we all got to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And the the import really, you listen to Nude and even the the the, the EP you can completely tell that everything was all the songs were groove driven yeah every band's got their <clears throat> their thing every band's got their driver so you listen to a, a good example would be jane's addiction every band starts with eric avery's bass every every song right so it's it's like ev almost every song right and you, and you get the feeling that eric avery was probably the one that was kind of like the, the backbone of the band really and what a great band right but yeah but so but in opposite would be in in our bands everything was stan so stan kind of everything was groove based and, and it was all based around just the silly little things that he'd come up with and um no, which which are so you yeah stan's playing is so understated i mean it's so good yeah he's a he's got a really unique feel and it was very easy to write with him and so um there was only a couple songs that i mean we all brought ideas in I, I mean, I did. I brought ideas in all the time, and so the, a lot of the, a lot of the riffs that I had or I'd been working on were th were things I just would, find, you know, he'd start playing something. It was like, there you go. A good example is a song like "Goodbye," and uh, that song wrote itself. Which on, is honestly, that, that song wrote itself. We we I think we we were done with it in like ten minutes, and that's that is my favorite song on that whole record. Thank you. Yeah, that is my favorite favorite song on the entire record. And I, well, they're all great. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about nude. There's no, there's no dead weight. There's no, and eh, that could have, you know, that's it. There's no filler. What it, what, what do they say? Uh, Kelly told me this yesterday. Uh, somebody gave him a, uh, some Canadian guy had made a comment about, oh, he said, no filler, all killer <laughs> for the, for the Buck Cherry record. That's, awesome. that's exactly the way the nude, the nude record. And I, listen, everybody, I'm telling you right now. Get on Amazon, get on eBay, buy a copy. It is so that that record is so freaking good, and it's still relevant to this day. Well, thank you. It still sounds fresh, and I know I gush all over you. No, it's it's nice. All right, I, so I spent a lot of time, uh, many 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 years, where I just I didn't listen to it. I didn't. I actually, you know, didn't even really think it was good. And I I think they, there was a lot. It didn't it didn't do great business. Uh, you know, I it was just one of those things. It wasn't really. I was I think at the time I was kind of unhappy with with. Maybe, I don't know what I was unhappy with. I just, maybe it's just because it didn't do well. I just said, well, fuck it. It sucks. And we sucked. And um, and uh, I, I'm just going to do other things. And so I just moved on in my life and made other music and did other things. I didn't try to redirect anything based around, oh, I gotta, it's got to be like this. I just have always just made music and whatever yeah. comes out, comes out. Well, that's obvious. Yeah. But you know, man, it's like anything. When you, <laughs> and that, those, those really formative years, you're bearing your soul you're putting everything into this and you're young so you don't have the perspective oh no, you're fucking fearless too it's just right? like you're you're just fearless you'll do you you, you put a thousand percent into everything you do but the problem with that is you're so young you don't realize you don't really see the big picture like hey it's going to be okay if something doesn't work out yeah you kind of put your eggs in one bat and so it's kind of soul crushing that's why i got out of music for six years you go so hard and so long and you put it you put everything in there mm -hmm. and then when it doesn't happen you if you're insecure and all of us musicians are insecure oh yeah we end up kind of and it really takes the wind out of the sails and you can see why you were like oh this probably wasn't very good but dude i'm telling you it was so good uh what i'm really excited about is we're i want to continue on talk here about we got another good 10 10 12 15 solid minutes um, before we have to take a break, but please, man, continue how uh, continue down the path of how uh, how it it how the it changed when Brent came in, okay, and and all that, and then Dan, and then how the songs, you know, because you were at the Satyricon, you did the yeah. Monday nights, <clears throat> yeah, we did that Monday nights, and the piece I was going to go into is that so we meant, ended up uh, playing the show with uh, Mother Love Bone and Allison Chains, and it was actually a pretty pivotal moment for us. M number one, um, you know. I started talking to Mike Starr, um, the, who's a bass player at the time, um, and um, may rest in peace. Yeah, and uh, and Jerry, and um, and then everybody, everybody was just so fucking cool, and they, and they were, you know, you could see the camaraderie within the two bands. It's like, you know, Sean Kinney and um, and um, 
Andrew Wood were just chatting about playing video games and talking about, you know, oh man, next Sunday, let's get together at my house and do Gosh, this. And, and so, and you know, and Stone Gossard was a gr- just absolutely great dude. Jeff, Jeff and Matt was, and they're all such nice people. It was a really a great community. And, and it was, uh, and the thing that came out of that for me was that we were talking to Mike Starr and he handed us Allison Chains. He handed me the, their demo tape. It was just on a Max Cell cassette for <laughs> four songs. Love it. And, um, and they said that they'd been working at uh, London Bridge Studios in, in Seattle with uh, Rick Prosher. And I was like, oh, okay. Whatever. God rest his soul. Yeah, God rest his soul. God damn it. We lost an incredible dude there, too. But he, uh, so it wasn't until the next day, or maybe we went back to, to party at our house afterwards, just our band and whoever was with us. And we listened to the Alice in Chains demo. I was like, holy fuck. Yeah. We need to make a demo like this. Monstrous. Our demo our demo has to sound this yeah. good. Yeah. You know, obviously. And at the time in Portland, there was no places producing the sort of. There was a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of gr- great studios and there was a lot of, you know. But nothing that like people was so much... open and big. Yeah. No. And with, with that, and sounding natural. You know, the stuff that, that Drew did at Dogfish, and, and there was, it, it was, qual- it was, it was great. It that, was, that's where we recorded super all Super quality stuff, but it, it, it was, it was about the drum sound. And yeah. It was about the room. And so we did, um, which is all those records, the Pearl Jammer. And let's, hey, real quick, let's hit on, on who Rick was and yep. what albums he did. Well, you know, Pearl Jam 10, Temple of Dog. Yep. Temple of Dog 10. Yep. Um, uh, he did, he did, um, Allison, I mean, he didn't produce any of the Allison Chain stuff. Dave Jordan did, but they started all those records there. As a matter of fact, they started um, Facelift at Leonard Bridge Studios. But then when Andrew Wood died, it was so fucking devastating for their them and their community. They moved. They moved the recording. I think they went down south. Gotcha. I can't remember where they finished the record. Whether they just, it was Sausalito. They needed yeah to get their heads they in some other get, space. Yeah, it was, a, it was a crushing. It was pretty crushing for everybody. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I wasn't part of their community, so I don't know sure. much other than just just these little snits and little pieces that I heard that Rick told me about. But um, yeah, Rick was an absolutely amazing. That room, he and his brother Raj, they own Lennon Bridge Studios. They put it together themselves. Um, the wood in the f- and they they built everything themselves. Um, quite an amazing couple guys. And Raj was kind of like um, it just looked like it was in a neighborhood. It was, it's in an industrial, almost oh, an industrial okay. park. There's a picture of you guys playing basketball. basketball. Yeah. <laughs> with the Pearl Jam guys yeah, or something. Yeah. With, well, they were, they were recording Temple of the Dog and uh, Jeff was doing his bass overdubs and we came in to do overdubs for um, Showdown for mm. the, for the. Um, oh, cause you track, cause it, it's a different version. No, it's the same version. But we it's just, cut down, right? They, he, he edited it, they did an edit on it, and we added a couple of guitar overdubs. So okay. He wanted to thicken up the yeah. uh, the chorus, and um, he, um, um, sorry, I'm distracted, my, my son's trying to call me, and so I'm ignoring him. Uh, and we added the slide guitar at the very beginning of it. Which I love. Yeah. So that, yeah, that room, man, the drums in that room. They're in, it's an incredible sounding room. Which the drums on Nude are one I sh- listen. I have people listen to it all the time for great production. Yeah, Rick, we we were going to use Showdown on Nude, but Rick didn't like the way it sounded, and and, he, and so he was like, "We got to re-record it." And so oh, I see. we actually tried to re-record it, and we couldn't we couldn't make a version as good as we did on the get, demo. Wow, because the demo is, yeah. I mean, I get the sonic. There would be inconsistencies, right? Because there's some sonic difference. Lots of times, compression's different. Well, there's a it's a much different thing when you go in to make a record with a budget than when you go in to make a demo and you and you have two days of studio right. time. They fucking slam the mics up, right. everything's up. You don't take that much time. You no. just like, okay, tune your snare a little bit. Fuck it, it's good enough. Let's go. Right. And you know, we did those four day. We did those four songs, and you know, we said in two days. We tracked all the music one day. Dan did the vocals and overdubs uh, the next day, and then Rick mixed it and sent us a tape. And that was it. So let's talk about this really quickly, because mm-hmm. uh, I do want to get back to you got the cassette and you're like, oh, man, shit, we need to record here. But at what point? No, no. You know what? I'll save this. I'm going to save this. I'm going to save this. G- jump into. But what I will say is this. So we knew we needed to record because I have and, something to say about about Dan and the harmonies and all that. And so we basically uh, were like, um, but Steve Kruger, Dan's older brother, was pretty he was he was pretty much a fan of what we were doing. He was really into it. Well, where did, how did he play into this? Dan, I mean, Steve, Steve ended up kind of being our manager. For oh, a bit. Gotcha. He actually was our manager. Gotcha. Um, and so, and he actually funded the, the demo. Wow. And he, do you remember what, it, what the total cost was? 
I don't. I don't think it was. I don't think it was astronomical. A couple grand. A couple grand, probably. Yeah, yeah. It'd yeah. be my guess. Um, but he funded. He funded the demo. And um, where'd you guys stay when you went up there? I don't know. I, we probably stayed at a Ramada Inn or something. We stayed. We stayed at a, a, a motel for a couple days. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It was a nowhere special, um, but somewhere close to. It was close to the studio. I mean, you know, there the studio is out in Seattle. I don't know if any, everybody knows Seattle, but it's Lake Forest Park, exit one seventy eight. It's way north Seattle. Well, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, I do. Oh, I could, I could get there with my eyes closed. Is there a studio still there? Yep, still there. Oh, yeah, who's yep. running it now? Uh, John Plum and John is a pretty phenomenal human being fucking t crazy cool talented guy i didn't meet john during those sessions but we met him later they were um well it's a long story so i'm not going to go into john's story but he he came in as an intern and ended up long story short working for rick for many years and he gotcha. ended up buying the studio from rick that's pretty typical you know yeah. those guys move into that yeah okay. so he's still got he's still got the studio, the two-inch studio machine he's still, wow. he's still got the neve console he's Think got all that music gear. that yeah. was recorded on that Oh yeah, yeah. That, on that deck, yeah. That tape machine is historic. Wow. And that and that board is amazing. They don't. You won't find many uh, twenty four track neves like yeah. that around. You just won't. Yeah. So okay. So let's. Uh, so you get the cassette. You go. We got to record here. So how'd you connect? Did, did, who was the guy that made the phone call to get to Leonard Bridge? Yeah. Oh well, I we I called Mike Starr, and first of all, I want to get the information correctly. He gave me Leonard Bridge's phone number. But it was wrong. And, and and I we called we called the studio and and booked the time. Oh wow. And it, that's all there is to it. We, we booked time, and, and I think it was it all happened fairly quickly. And that was before any of those bands had really hit. So Well, Facelift... Because Pearl Jam wasn't even a thing. When when when, when Mother yeah. Love Bone was happening, uh, yeah. Pearl Jam wasn't even a thing because they were half of them were in Mother Love Bone. Yeah, it wasn't... Yeah. It's, I, I, I don't think I'm going to get my timeline in, incorrect here, but we went and did our demo, and then um, I remember we got... we had all had everything you know produced at super digital we had like you know i don't remember how many cassettes we had made but it, I, right. we had fucking boxes of, of shrink wrap cassettes you're like yes we made yeah. it well everything was, remember those was days? yeah dude it was so rad we had our, our friend patty mcnally oh. who's still one of my favorite facebook friends because she's a fucking amazing artist and she's always posting really kick-ass shit but she was working for nike at the time and she was a, a regular satiricon and we became good friends right. and she she was like you know uh, I think she even offered to. Can I, do you mind if I do your graphics, some graphics for you? Oh. And so she made the graphics for our our first logo and our and the graphics for this the the and uh, Stan's girlfriend's mom did the photos and um and that was it. We had this, the cassette made. Once they were done, I don't know. A lot of people will probably remember that Portland used to have the Mayor's Ball. Yeah. And the first Mayor's Ball we ever played, we played in one of the side rooms. But it was fucking exciting, man. We, I remember being so just stoked. We, we just picked up our tapes. And I had this, this huge ass box of tapes, and I left uh, it on the roof of my car. <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, I didn't, no, I didn't treat it like my children. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I tr no, I'm kidding. I, 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 we babied them, and and I remember bringing them into there. And the first person I saw when I walked in was um, a guy named Dan Sauce, and Dan Sauce owned. Um, locals only record store. Oh, you sure? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, of course and, I do. And his brother was the we bass sold player. we sold Thunder Jelly tapes there. <laughs> Everybody did. It was fucking awesome. Yeah. And I remember going up to him and just like I wanted to hand him this whole box. Here, <laughs> take our tapes, <laughs> sell our tapes. And, and, but um, I think he was like he. I remember him just like kind of being taken okay, back. Kid. But yeah, All right, pretty kid. much. And this goes a different, whole different way than this. But <laughs> but anyway, we gave a whole bunch of tapes out and um, got them in as many people's hands as possible. And literally. Within a week, we started getting phone calls, and first one was a guy, and I can't remember the dude's name. He came in, he was from LA, and he was like, "I can get you guys signed. I know I can get you signed." Um, whoa! And he wanted to, and we were like, "Whoa, whoa, oh, what a trip! Awesome!" And well, you guys were the the demo was really good. It, it, you know, it was good. The song, it, 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 it was good, and no, uh, it was it was it it came off really cool. And there's a lot of things that go into that that are you know it's 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 greater than some of its parts kind of thing you know they were they were fun songs good vibe dan cut loose in the studio and ended up harmonizing with himself and was which something we did also something we didn't know he okay could do. yes the, uh, this is what i want to talk about I, I want to ask you all of this stuff so the 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 harmonies on the um on the on the ep are really a precursor to nude yep um which he really went like oh, there, it's so layered, but not in a huge overproduced winger kind of a way. Yeah. 
they're so unique. And of course it goes back to his m musical sensibilities. Yeah. And that like I said, Dan is a, a one musical motherfucker. I mean, honestly, he, uh, He's kind of the, the ultimate musical jack of all trades. There is not a damn thing that he couldn't pick up and play. And, um, and that is an absolute fact. He's just, it just oozes, oozes it. And um, so figuring out, realizing he has this innate ability to hear harmonies, not only harmonies, multiple harmonies and good, yeah. and good ones, and, and, just, and just rifle them off. And, and so he basically, um, we didn't have all the time in the world to do the demo, but he kind of started laying things down. It was like, fuck this bitch and do another one, do another yeah, one, yeah. do another one. And so, and so that's kind of how that kind of came to be. What the was... bummer about it was not really reproducible. <laughs> Here goes my, <laughs> oh, Bubba. Not, not really what? Reproducible live. Oh yeah. I mean, we could do a little oh, bit. We could do a little bit, but Brent, Brent was a, a pretty good singer. And so he, he pulled that off pretty well, but yeah, yeah, the layers, man, there's nothing you can do about that. Well, let me, I got to ask you something. Yeah. Did, on on the nude record, jeez. Excuse me, that must oh. have been the tikka masala. Bubba, go lay down. Go lay down. There's this. There's a dog, a giant, 150 pound Great Pyrenees with a satellite dish shaped cone around his head. All right, so listen. Uh, we're not going to take a break yet. In a sec, we're going to take a break. Let's let's jump on this really quickly. Um, very much more layered and nude was very much har as far as the harmonies. Um, you obviously had the budget and the time to do that, but what was, was, did Rick have any input? I'm saying, Hey, let's add this harmony oh, here absolutely, or, or, absolutely. or did Dan hear all that stuff himself? I think it was a combo platter, you know, uh, Dan, Dan could hear it, but Rick encouraged it. Wow. And I think Rick had a lot of fun with it too, you know, cause um, he would also do, Dan would also do that low octave on his voice we'd well, sing the low octave he didn't do it with an auto -tune. no 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 yeah he, he yeah he had a pretty pretty big range and he had because he was always high right it always had that i hate to, i'm sure he hates to hear this but it always had that perry farrell kind of jeans addiction tone sonically to sure. it because he had that high register that was like but was dirty right mm -hmm. but he'd add that low octave to some of the stuff and it was it was cool yeah no it's pretty neat sonically um where was I going to go here with this? Um, sorry, brother. Did you, um, sorry, now I'm drawing a blank. I had a point that I was going to make, but you know what? We have to save it to the next segment. We'll get there. Well, listen, we're, this is a good time to take a break. Sure. We've got, uh, this is Joel Kinney and this is uh, coffee break with JFK podcast. We've got Dirk Sullivan from love on ice, uh, old mill. And of course, Hey, what's, what's in your new project going to be called? I don't know. Is is it the Dirk Sullivan experience? <laughs> is it? Uh, you know what? There's I don't know DSE. I, I don't even know what it is yet. Okay. You know what I mean? So it's it, I kind of it's one of those things. You kind of wait and see what wait and see what it, what comes out of it. Um, Heavy banjo. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Real swinging banjos. A lot of banjos. Mm -hmm. But listen, we're gonna take a break. We got Dirk Sullivan here. Uh, listen, we'll be right back.